much, everybody, for coming to Glory Road for this, this teaching here today. Uh, I am excited to bring this word to you. The title of this message is You Are It. And so let's go to our foundation scripture, which is going to be in Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And we're going to be reading the first six verses of Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is this. Get this settled in your heart. His name is meant to be represented in this earth. Now, I know every Christian is trying to go to heaven, but His name is to be represented in the earth. So earth, you better get it settled in your mind, is your home. That's where you're supposed to be. So we need to start figuring out how this name works in the earth. That's where you're, you, and, you and the name of God are supposed to function right here in this natural realm. So how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. So it's telling me right here that his name and the glory in it on the earth and in the earth is higher than the glory that operates in heaven. Now, you, did you catch that? Now, what does that mean? Now, he's not talking about it's more powerful on the earth than it is in heaven. What he's saying is this, is that when the glory shows up in earth, you see it and it looks so beautiful and, and grandeur and, and just wonderful. When you're in heaven, it's just a culture. But in the earth, it just, it is so big to you because we're not used to seeing the glory. We're not used to seeing the life. So when you see it, it looks like it's higher than the glory that's in heaven because you don't live in heaven in that culture. You're not there in that culture living in every day. So when you experience the glory here in the earth, it's big to you. Wouldn't it be if you saw something glorious take place? If you saw you got cut on the hand and all of a sudden, you know, you spoke to it and then it was healed immediately? Wouldn't you feel like, oh my gosh, you didn't have to wait two months for it to heal and then the scar, you know, still be faintly in the back? No, you would be thinking so big about what you experienced. So, let's go here to verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now some people say, now see that God makes you strong because of the enemies, you know, sickness and disease and the curse. and He uses those things to make you strong. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that the name that he has given you and the the anointing and the glory that's in that name, that's in you, that as you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, your enemies are going to know how strong you really are. It's not talking about he's using the enemies of sickness, disease, and poverty, and all the frustration to be the thing that helps you become strong. No. If that were the case, everyone in the world would be spiritual giants because everybody's going through all these circumstances. But it's the one that knows how to use his name, speak from the inside, and believe that what they say is going to happen, they're going to cause the strength of their enemies to become nothing. They become strong. The enemies become weak. (laughs) <laughs> and so this is part of the renewing of the mind. Religion doesn't teach us this much. It doesn't teach you that you're strong until you go to heaven. And then what's the point of being strong there? You need to be strong in a place that needs the strength of God, and that's this natural realm. So out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. So the enemy is going to become still compared to what you are by what you say. They're going to be stilled or stand in place, back up, say, excuse me, and run away because of what comes out of you, what you believe in your heart and what you say with your mouth. When you're saying it in the name of I am. That's the name of God, I am. Well, I thought the name was Jesus. (laughs) The name is I am. This is Old Testament now. This is where he's talking about really the, the power of his name, the strength in his name. His name works in the earth. It just needs an I am representative to stand in the earth and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection life. I am the one that gets the death off of everything, gets the curse off of everything. 
So, verse 3, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that thou visitest him. So he's saying, when I look at the moon, the stars, and everything that you have ordained to shine brightly, and, and how big and how far away they are, and majestic and huge, then what is man that he looks like he's just a little person of here on this earth, just a little tiny dot, and yet you have ordained him with the strength that's stronger than all the glory of your creation. All the work of your hands. He's stronger than that. He has more glory than that. God has put the glory that He used to, <coughs> excuse me, to create everything and put that glory in this one little man. You. <laughs> Me. My wife. My kids. All have the glory, the same glory that created everything. He compacted and molded and fit in you. How is that possible? I don't know. When they talk about, when they talk about, because I got my phone up here, when they talk about today's technology, what you hold in your hand, in that phone, has more power, more generating power, gigabyte power, has more space, has got more everything than what they used in all the computers and all that to cause the Apollo to land on the moon. That spaceship. More technology in your hand. How did they do that? They compacted all of those computers that were working together, big computers, all into the palm of your hand. What, you mean, do you what changed that? Thinking. Thinking. That's what did it. The thinking created the technology that made it happen. If men today, or I should say, if the men back there in the 60s were thinking like they are today, they would have created the technology back then. They wouldn't have had to need the big computers if they were thinking then like they're thinking today, what they're thinking today. The question is, what are you going to be thinking at 3 o'clock today, at 2 o'clock tomorrow, or next week, or the week after? Are you still going to be thinking like you were back there 20 years ago? Or is the technology of the power of God's presence in you going to show up? and reveal what God is right now, seated in heavenly places. Because that's where you are. What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that you visit him? For thou hast made him, who? The man. A little lower than the angels. The word angel there is the word Elohim. It means God. It's not talking about little angels with little wings. It's talking about you have made man a little lower than yourself. In other words, your spirit he, the man is a spirit, but you've clothed him with a physical body, and now he lives in a material realm. But he still has God's authority, God's power, God's might, the Spirit of Christ abiding in him, but he's made him to live in a lower realm called a natural material realm. But he's given him the same authority. That's why he says, what is man that you have, that you have made him to be just like you in this natural realm, to have dominion over the fish, the sea, the power of the air, and all of these things? Thou madest him to have dominion over the work of thy hands, and thou hast put all things, not some things, all things under his feet. Who? The man's feet. Now here's what I want you all to understand. You and I have been told all of our lives who we are. Oh yeah, Johnny, yeah, he's a son of a... <laughs> Some will say, that son of a... <laughs> Some guy might say, yeah, he's a good old son of a gun. While the other guy said, no, nah, he's a son of a you-know-what. You see, we've always been told who we are. Some will say, yeah, well, he's, he's the grand, uh, grandson of uh, Betty's uh, cousin who's... You know, and, and they talk like that. that you've always been labeled by your parents, well, he's never going to be anything, or I tell you what, they're really going to change the world. You know, they tell you who you are. But we have never been told what we are. And what you are is what determines who you become. See, you have to know what you are. If somebody doesn't know what a truck is, then they're going to get in a truck and, and misuse its purpose. So yeah, you might see a guy down there with a truck and he's, he's doing something else with it. He's putting flower bed in it and he's using it in the backyard, you know. And, and putting in dressing it and using it as a garden. 
<laughs> or whatever, but he doesn't know what it is. So he misuses it. When you don't know the purpose of a thing, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be misused or, um, or manipulated. So we know who we are. We don't know what we are. And I want us to be addressed with, with this idea of what we are. You are what you have been looking for. It's on the inside of you. What is it you're looking for? Well, Jesus came preaching in Matthew 4, 17. He said, the kingdom of heaven is here. It's not. It is here. Now change the way you think. Because he's trying to get you reconnected with the kingdom mentality. Because with the thinking produces the kingdom. You think like a king. You produce the world of the king. And in the king, in his domain, becomes the kingdom. The king domain. The king dominion. And that's what you are. You're a king. That's what you are. People look at you as who you are with your identity with this natural body. It's like I said before. If somebody's looking for me in a mall, they're not looking... I mean, they're looking for my body. I want to see... Oh, there's Adam. Yeah, he's standing over there against the wall next to the donut shop, <laughs> waiting in line or something like that, you know? So that, they recognize there he is, but you haven't contacted me. You, don't, you might not realize that the person standing there on the wall getting ready to buy a cookie could be the most powerful person you've ever met once you realize what they are. Every single one of you need to know that you are in the image of God. So when you're standing wherever you're standing or sitting wherever you're sitting or lying wherever you're lying or working wherever you're working, you are God's presence in the earth. That's what you are. That should change who you become in your conversation, in your thinking, in the way you act. Everybody's looking for the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah, the sky's going to split wide open and Jesus, we're going to meet Him in the air. <laughs> you're waiting on Him. But He's in you. <laughs> so so he's, he's saying, I'll tell you one thing, I want to arise and shine in you, but you're going to have to start identifying yourself with me. We have to identify ourselves with Christ's identity on the inside. So let's go to Psalm 9, starting in verse 10. Psalm 9, starting in verse 10. And they that know thy name, what's his name? I am. Exodus chapter 3 tells us that the name I am is for every generation. To be a memorial to every generation, that name will never change. It's I am. Even when you say Jehovah Jireh, I am the Lord that provides your need. That's what he's saying. The Lord. I am the Lord that provides your need. You see. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that heals you. It's the I am nature. This is why Jesus' name was called Jesus. It's Jehovah. The I am. So you take on His identity by, by walking in this earth with the identity of I am the solution. So let's start reading in verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. They'll put themselves in the name. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. What are they seeking? The kingdom. What's the kingdom? It's the way a king talks in his domain. It's his identity. You're not trying to get to the kingdom by being, you know, a man of democracy. <laughs> you know, well, everybody has their opinion about the kingdom. No, you're, you're thinking like a democratic person. It doesn't matter anybody's opinion. What does the king say? And when you're walking in the earth as king and you're saying only what he says and you say it the way he says it, you take on that identity where you're not moved by people's opinions because you know people's opinions don't function in a kingdom. You got to show them that whatever you say is law. Because you're basing what you say on as if you're a king standing there as a righteous, benevolent, loving king. That you're there to, to master the environment with your presence. To conform everything to the image of Christ in you. Verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord which dwell in Zion. Declare among the people His doings. How do you declare among the people His doings? Well, you know, just tell them what Jesus, what God did back then in the Old Testament. No, no, it says you declare His doings. The Bible said be doers of the Word. Be doers of what the Word would do, who is God, if He was standing right there. 
Be doers of it. Demonstrate. Be, talk like Him. Give somebody something to believe. You know? So sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people His doings. When He maketh inquisition for blood, for well, He remembereth them, for uh, He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Now listen here to the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Now notice what, what David is saying here. He is saying, Lord, I recognize that as I humble myself before you, that you raise me up in due time, that you promote me in due time, that when it looks like I'm in the pit all around me, you're there to get me out of the pit. Notice God didn't dig the pit, put you in there. He's the great deliverer. He delivers you from the pit. What does the pit represent? Death, the grave. He delivers you from the pit. He delivers you from it. But if you think that God has got you where you're going to die. He's appointed a day for you to die. And He's sitting there waiting with a, something to knock you in the head to put you in the pit. Then why in the world would David be saying, you're the one that lifts me up out of this thing? You're the one that lifts me from the gates of death. Notice it didn't say the gates of hell. It just said the gates of death. So if, he can, if we can get this death thing where we can get it off of us, you don't have to worry about hell anymore. <laughs> you see that? Hey, yeah, well, what about heaven? Don't you have to die to go to heaven? No, because it's heaven's life that causes you to be delivered from the death to start with. Verse 14, That I may show forth all the praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion, I will rejoice in thy salvation. In other words, you're going to lift me up as I humble myself before you under your mighty hand. Your mighty hand is going to reveal that it's my life, that I live by your strength and your power. As I'm delivered from death, I have something to go tell somebody else, and I will go declare it. And the gates of hell will not prevail against me. You see, the gates of hell, the gates of death, nothing's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life when you know how to humble yourself and know that the life in Christ that's in you saves you from this death. Now, what actually makes this happen? Well, first of all, remember I told you, you have to know what you are. You are, and I like to put this, and when you get my notes, you'll see it in there, for those of you that get my notes. He says, you are, and I put this in there, G-O-D. G period, O period, D period. I'm not saying you're God, as in the God. What I'm saying is, is that the word God means this. Governor of dominion. That's what God represents. We know He's the all-sufficient one. He's ever-present. He's all-powerful. He's, he never changes. You see. See, God, the governor of dominion, which is what you are, has the power and authority to change energy into another form. Huh? See, here's where you, you gotta gotta, you know, you gotta understand this part. Most people, most Christians don't even understand this. They they may have heard it and they thought it was some Eastern religion kind of thinking, but no, it's a truth. Scientifically proven to be true. Everything has energy. People who don't even believe in God know this. They know everything has energy. Everything is movement. Everything is vibrating at a certain level. Now that's not some Eastern religion. That's just the truth. Everything is moving. Everything is vibrating. If you put it under a microscope, it don't matter what it is, you intensify it up strong enough, you're going to see movement in that thing. Everything is. Now God, the governor of dominion, and then dominion means you have the power and the authority to change the energy into another form. Now, we understand this naturally because you can take an ice tray, fill it up with water, stick it in a freezer, and within just a few hours, that thing has come out to be in another form. Ice. Now, it's, it's, water is energy. It's just in a certain form. Vibrating at a certain level, and it, it manifests as water. 
you can take that water and the authority of your choice to put it in a freezer changes the consistency of it. You change it into another form. Now, this is exactly what Jesus did when he took a cup of fish and a few loaves of bread there, you know, and he changed its consistency, changed it into another form and made more and more and more. He changed the consistency of the storm. And he went from the storm being there to the storm not being there. He changed the consistency. He changed the energy that was behind it. This is what God can do. And he says, oh, what is man that you are mindful of him or that you gave him the fullness of your mind? That's what the mind of Christ is. Now, with the mind of Christ, you can think with a whole different technology. You can think with the mind of Christ, you think with the technology of heaven. You've got that potential in you. Just because you haven't discovered it doesn't mean you don't have it. Somebody could have come into your house and slipped a $100 bill in some place in your house and told you that you have $100. And you're like, man, I sure wish I had $100. No, you've got it. What do you mean I've got it? Oh, it's in this house. I know it is. You just got to find it. Now, you'll be $100 richer if you find it. Until you find it, it's sitting there. Not doing you any good. But once you find it, more now you've got $100 worth of power. Well, God is saying that He abides in you and you've got, you got God amount of power in you. But you haven't found it. And you're never going to find it until you start believing the one that's telling you you've got it. Then you start accessing it. Start expecting it to show up. Now you start talking like you're a person of power. That's how you get it moving. Now, instead of just accepting all the form in front of you, yeah, well... We're never going to have enough money. It seems like our wallets and purses are always empty. Well, do you like that form of that energy is taking? Absolutely not. Then change it. See, now people say, well, that sounds like law of attraction. That sounds like this and that. That sounds like positivity. That sounds like... It is. <laughs> every religion is... I'm telling you, what, every religion's looking for the same thing. And that's the power to control your circumstances. It's the power of God's life manifested in you. Jesus was showing us this. We just made a religion out of stuff. Took out the principle of life, which is the most important thing about manifesting God's presence, is you got to have His life working. We took that out and we said, we'll get that after we die. Now you took out the element that causes anything to be even be manifested. You see that? Take out God's life, you'll never be able to manifest the power of God. Put God's life back in your equation by representing the life of God. Stop expecting death all around. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll start seeing God show up in your life. So everything is energy, friends, and we are the agents of change. You are the agents. You are the ambassador of Christ. You are the agent God has put in this earth to, to replenish it with the presence of heaven. That's your job. That's my job. That's your purpose. That's the only purpose you'll ever have. It's never going to change. God's intention for creating Adam was for that purpose. And when he spoke to Adam to have dominion, you and I were the seed that was within Adam. That word has never changed. Ever, 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 ever is the reason why he created us. So if you're trying to find some kind of satisfaction in doing something with the work of your hands and you're finding it's falling real short because you don't know your real purpose, then I would tell you, locate the purpose. Believe what I'm telling you. Then God will take that purpose, the life of God, and it will bless all the work of your hands. Everything you put your hands to, everything you say, everything you see will become contingent or will be actually become conformed to the way God thinks on the inside of you. Remember, change isn't change until you change it. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I just wish this whole thing would change. Well, get up and change it. I don't know how to do that. I ain't got the education to do that. You don't need education. You need revelation. <laughs> revelation of who you are in Christ. Like I said, you are the thing you're looking for. Everybody wants heaven to show up. I'll tell you what, which God would take control. He's in you. The kingdom's in you. The glory's in you. That's called the power. That's the power that gives the agent the ability to change anything. But you're going to have to stand up and start believing. You're going to, have to start taking notice of who you, who you really, really are in Christ. See, the greatest tragedy, listen to this, the greatest tragedy to your life is to go through life while being absent from the real you. Did you catch that? I'm going to say that one more time. 
Now, if you get the message on YouTube, you'll get this, you'll get this quote, so you don't necessarily have to write it down. But if you're not going to get it, you need to write it down. The greatest tragedy to your life is to go through life while being absent from the real you. See, we know who we are based on what other people have said about us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know her. I know him. Let me tell you about them. You know, and it, you want to believe, oh, yeah, like they're the gospel truth. <laughs> you know, everybody has some negative to say about somebody. But when you start looking at people at what they are, my gosh, these are, we are deposits of God's glory in the earth. Don't you wish you could plug into that? I guarantee you, you get around somebody who doesn't know what they are and you start talking to them because you know what they are, all of a sudden you're going to give them a hope to become something that nobody has ever said to them before. That's what you've got to tell people, you know, what they are. Connect them to what they really are in Christ. Well, I sure hope you got something out of this today. Until we meet again, I'm Adam King. God bless you. Bye-bye.